Hey there, welcome to the course overview for programming through mobile app development, Information Science 250. Um, I'm John Linstead, and I am a professor here in the computer science department. I'm also a cognitive scientist, and that's sort of my, or my jam. Um, but my experience in cognitive science was all programming, all information, all data science, all that kind of stuff. So. I am in a position to start you on your journey here in the programming course. So um, you can call me Dr. JKL. That's kind of the, the common parlance for me around here. And yeah, let's get into it. So this being the course overview, we are going to go through a few different things, right? This is a sort of the broad strokes, but we'll, we'll talk about some details as well. First, what's an app um, versus what's a mobile app? What's a web app? You know, what are these different things? Um, what exactly is programming? You might be surprised to see that, but I think it's worth diving into right here at the start. It can kind of demystify some things. What will we be actually be doing in the course? And how does all this connect to information science more broadly? You know, try to help, help situate this in your education. So... What is an app? Those little square candies, right? Well, app is just short for application. Now, that that's the an old distinction between application software, where you're trying to do something with your computer, versus system software that is the stuff that the computer just runs automatically, right? And we know them, you know, in the classic sense of the clickable icons, the things, you know, on your desktop or on your phone, home screen or whatever, that if I tap Hulu, I can start watching Bob's Burgers, right? And that is in the, in the most basic sense, that's an app. So what's the deal? What's an application? Why is that the focus here? Applications are a specific kind of program. Um, Computers exist to move data around as fast as possible at the sort of most fundamental level, right? You're moving things between the, the hard disk at, at a certain rate to memory to at an even faster rate to the CPU or the GPU. But you, a human being, can't just sit down and say to this blindingly fast computer, hey, computer, take this 2 million pixel matrix and do these types of math on it to transform it into another 2 million pixel matrix and do it at least 60 times per second, and then I'm playing Fortnite. You know, that's, that's too low a level of description. Uh, instead, we think in terms of what tasks can this computer help me achieve, right? the things we want to get done. And that's kind of anything, right? It's not just, you know, oh, I want to compute the, the math behind my accounting. It's like watch a movie, write notes, text friends, right? We use computers for friggin' everything these days. So what's an app application? It's using code that the computer understands. We write specific programs that human users can apply to specific tasks. Okay, so what are some flavors of apps? We're going to cover a broad range here. So it's kind of anything um, in a sense, but really any program a computer runs for you to interact with, you can consider an app. This could include super simple tools, um, text editors, word processors, uh, texting and social media apps, video apps, games are, you know, they're apps as well. So let's just kind of bounce around these and have have an, a casual analysis of each of each kind of app here. Different flavors, right? So some are very simple tools. We have things like timers and alarms. Uh, we have things like calculators, right? Uh, so timers, alarms, calculators, uh, very simple things. These are these are very straightforward tools that let you do things that your brain isn't super great at, right? Just like how you might use a hammer to strike a nail, something none of, nothing in your body is good at. These are simple tools to help your brain do things like keep perfect time, uh, execute math with perfect logic in an instant, right? Not doing it on our hands and fingers and such. Um, 
and the information involved here is relatively simple. Uh, a timer will track a single decreasing number uh, when it comes right down to it. It might display it a little different. You know, it has the hours and the minutes and the seconds and all that. But really, it's just keeping track of one number that every tick of the clock will decrease until ding, 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 your alarm goes off. Uh, a calculator will take one or two numbers and perform different operations on them. Like, okay, I'm two times four, blah, blah, blah. Now, if you need a calculator to do two times four, that's, that's don't do that. <laughs> so now let's ramp it up a little bit. Text editors, these friendos, um, they're a little more complex than those super simple tools, but not a whole lot more. See, this one, it's keeping track of not just one value, but a whole bunch of letters, right? That's really what's happening here, right? This is this is a data type known as a string. So text editors are all about saving one string that you have typed in. It also allows you to edit that string by inserting letters wherever you want. Um, you can also save that information, that string, that data, to the disk, which can be later loaded, right? So. And there's a few other features like search and replace, but not a whole lot else. So you're seeing that this is yet another simple application of a computer allowing me to do a thing. And it's more than just like count a number down until an alarm goes off. Now we get into word processors, which feel similar to text editors, but they are so much more, right? Um, we can ramp the complexity up. So look at this interface. There's a lot going on here. It's not just a white square waiting for me to type individual letters in. It's got all kinds of new sorts of information, right? So on top of the things that a text editor does, a word processor adds loads of extra functionality, right? So each button you might think of as a function of the app's program. We'll return to that later. Um, so there's more types of information considered here, right? There's I can apply fonts and colors and bold and italics. I can add images and shapes. I can change the alignment of all of the text, all the images on the page, right? All kinds of other things too, right? You think about anything you've ever written for a paper uh, in, in a text that, or in a, rather a word processor and start thinking about the information there. You know, the margins, those are all a number. Uh, the The font size, that's all numerical font. Uh, what font family you're using, that's more of a sort of a categorical thing. But there's a lot more information in the mix. Are you seeing? Okay, let's keep moving around though. Um, so not necessarily more complex, but just another application of sort of text and, and the like. So texting, you know, I got to send you a message on the phone or, or like Discord, which is a little more complex, but you know, it's really just texting plus video and audio. Right, so these have a little less complex um, information overall, right? It, I'm not, I'm not like, what's the word? It, we don't do alignment and margins. We don't, we don't do, you know, font color. Well, sometimes you do font colors, but in the most simple texting apps, like on the default ones on your phone, it's really just I'm sending you a quick message. The thing that this does that, that these systems add that are that are key is that now we have to have network connectivity, right? So the programs, the the apps running these things have to be able to open up connections to a network and <clears throat> they have to open up the right connection to the network to a server usually or directly to your phone. You know, sometimes it's just peer to peer. Sometimes it's it goes to the server first. Discord is an example of something where I send a message, it goes to the server, the server says, ooh, um, I, I, you have a message for this person, I should send that to them as soon as I'm able. Uh, well, with a lot of trafficking stuff going on too. So yeah, um, this is another application, yeah? You're, you're seeing that you know we, we are jumping between different things that people need to do with a computer and all of the sort of we're starting to take a peek at the kinds of features and the kinds of information that we have to use in these apps. Um, videos, video apps, YouTube or your Hulus and your your um, Netflixes and all that. So 
Video apps deal in transmitting video data. Well, of course, right? And it's usually just one direction. I send a link to the server or, or a specific request to the server, and it says, oh, let me dig up that video file and start streaming it to you in little packets. Um, and it's one directional unless you're a content creator like someone or maybe uploading lectures, who knows? Uh, and they have lots of other little functions, right? They, it's not just video dumps into my screen, it's video dumps into my screen, but I can adjust things like the playback speed, I can pause, I can move back and forth in the timeline, all that kind of stuff. And the whole app exists to help us comprehend video data visually. In addition, they typically feature some amount of like analysis on their end, right? So their server, their version of their of this tool is looking at the videos that you watch, and then it's running a bunch of analysis, usually like machine learning type stuff, to say, okay, if you like these videos, I have a huge, you know, recommender algorithm that will that takes into account other videos you have watched and how recently and other videos other people have watched and I can recommend you a video, right? Which is a lot more complex, right? That's not the kind of stuff we'll necessarily be focus focusing on in this course, but that is more information moving around, right? It's not just, YouTube is not just give me a video, YouTube is give me a video and then I'm gonna do a bunch of magic backstage to make sure I can keep you watching videos because that's my business model. So further up the complexity tree, we get into games, right? We got Candy Crushes, Fortnites, Minecrafts, Elden Rings. You know, we have huge numbers of games out there. It's a multi-billion dollar industry right now. And end of the day, it's still all informational, right? Um, however, your inputs are a little more simple than even than even a text editor, right? You are you when you enter into operating a text editor, you are using all the different keystrokes. You're going fast, blindingly speed, but um, you know not instead of whole lines of text over the course of an hour, it's really just a few buttons used in combination as you go. Now that is of course its own form of complex, but. The, the language of a game is usually a few buttons that are mappable to a controller, right? Um, these also are still featuring some form of saving and loading information, you know, to the, to the, to the disc. And in, a, in an interesting way, it's kind of like a text editor. Some games even use plain text as the, as the save format. Um, but... The overall, what we're trying to achieve with these tasks, with these game tasks, is to be entertained, right? We're not submitting reports, we're not sending an email, we are just enjoying the act of hitting buttons and watching things change on the screen. I know that makes us sound kind of like a like monkey see, monkey do, but come on, humans are predictable in that way. <laughs> so... All, all said, you know, why are we looking at all these different app flavors? Well, the point is when you boil down any app to its really basic operations in terms of information, they start to look pretty similar. The user gives some kind of inputs. The system does some amount of processing or transformation of the, of the information in the system. And then it has to output something to the display for the user's benefit. So for example, if user inputs the italicize command on a selection of text in a word processor, the system runs a function that transforms that portion of the text's data to have the italics property, right? So there, there is a string that has the letters, but then there is also this metadata inserted that says, hey, when you render this, so when the system outputs it, give it that slight slant that we expect when we see italics. It's a very simple operation that we're talking about here, but that is the core functionality of an app. You give inputs, something happens, and then outputs come back. So let's talk about platforms of apps because apps can exist kind of anywhere, right? So it's not we're not just talking about phone apps. Um, remember, apps just means using code for a specific application and not a system process. So. This can be kind of anywhere that computing takes place, 
we of course know phones and tablets, desktop computers, obviously, and laptops and lots more. Let's, let's jump through a few of them and think about these different platforms. So mobile apps, phone or tablet are, is the, that's kind of the nomenclature here. Uh, we got an iPhone and an Android phone. So mobile platforms are where that term for app was actually originally coined when, when, you know, application software was the going name. And then when we got the first smartphones, I had to shorten that because people need short words, apparently. Uh, with, no, it's smart. It's smart. It's smart to shorten. Um, the original phone apps, though, were, were pretty simple, right? They weren't getting really fancy. Phones didn't have a whole lot of features that you would um, you associate with modern phones. Um, you know, the camera app would take the photos and then a fully separate app for photos shows those photos, right? Very single purpose. Uh, instead of some like large scale media library you would use to separate, it, they, they would use separate apps for um, music and podcasts and photos and TV and all that stuff. So this is the platform. It, it's, it was sort of originally defined by its narrow scope. Obviously these have gotten a lot more powerful as, as time has gone on. Uh, you could probably do 90% of your coursework on a phone at this point, with, given the number of, you know, word processing apps that exist and the way that Brightspace has its own app and all that kind of stuff. I'm not recommending you do that. I think there's some issues, you know, it's, phones have limited real estate, right? Um, desktop apps. Now these are, you know, they have a different feel because there's a lot more processing power, typically. Any, any computer large enough to fit on a desktop instead of jammed into your pocket, it's going to have more space for things like graphics processors and um, stronger CPUs and bigger hard drives and all that. They also typically have more screen real estate, more usable space, right? And they have access to more kinds of input devices. You know, you have your keyboard and your mouse are actual physical objects that you can interact with in a different way than a simple, you know, virtual one. Um, webcams and all that. So this means that desktop apps can be a lot more feature rich. They can be more complex. Think about the text editors or sorry, the word processors we were talking about before, right? It's harder to interact with a word processor given the number of features it has on a phone or a tablet than it is on a desktop machine. And that really ends up mattering quite a bit. Um, this also can mean that they're sometimes quite bloated. If you've ever, if you've ever used an app on a desktop that you kind of feel like, why are there so many, what are they doing? They, they, this lacks focus, right? That's not, that's a common problem, right? When sometimes you give yourself enough extra processing power and screen real estate and you start thinking, oh, well, my app should really be all encompassing. I should do everything. Eh, maybe not. Watches. Though now we got smart watches, right? Um, they have their own apps, uh, but again, even smaller screen real estate than a, than a phone. And furthermore, even less processing power, right? We had to cram even into an even tighter space on, on your wrist, not even in your pocket. Um, so oftentimes they'll involve connecting directly to a different device, uh, your phone, and th that then your phone can handle more heavy duty processing or access data that the phone, that the watch wouldn't really have access to like podcasts or music or whatever. Um, we can keep going, you know, uh, virtual reality apps. Now even more stuff going on here, right? It's, this is fun because it's nearly infinite screen real estate, right? You're, you're in this, big open 3D space where things can move around and slip around anywhere you want them. But it takes a lot of processing to render that. So processing, especially if you're using something like a Quest, which is an all-in-one headset and not just a peripheral for a computer, it's going to have to deal, it has to limit itself to some extent because it, again, it's like having a cell phone strapped to your face, right? Um, and it also has a very unique interface, right? It allows for all kinds of different things. We got gestures and 3D layouts and, and all kinds of fancy stuff going on. Although at the same time, there's a huge limitation that the virtual keyboard is trash. Um, it's not very fun to use. It's very slow, etc. Okay, let we get, I've 
put too many kinds of apps here. We got to keep going. Um, car apps. Yeah, even your car has some suite of apps. Now, mostly we'll just rely on your phone as a proxy somewhere to watch, but it has super limited processing power because um, car manufacturers are certainly not going to prioritize these luxury features, right? The screen is slow and not very smooth. It doesn't update very often. And on top of that, you have to think about there's new constraints here. This is a an app platform designed to be used in a car where while driving, you have to allow your apps to have certain features disabled because you aren't allowed to distract the driver while the car is in motion. Even further, we have toaster apps, among other kitchen appliances. Um, these usually aren't really that diverse and robust, but they do offer things like internet connectivity so that you can plan your morning toast from bed or whatever the heck you need that for. Um, comes off a little excessive in my opinion, but uh, yeah. So the point is anything with a screen can have some kind of custom software written for it to help you achieve tasks with whatever that thing is. And that is known as an app. Now, we've talked about all the different platforms of, of you know, kind of illustrating how anything that can compute and can display something can have an app on it. But really, the focus of this course is actually not, as the title suggests, mobile apps, but really web apps. Because, honestly, a lot of those hardware considerations wind up getting in the way. Um, so when you're not really interested in the specific hardware, you can look into web apps. Some apps like web apps are designed not for the hardware, but to be run in a web environment, right? So HTML, CSS, JavaScript, those kinds of languages running in a web browser. As we've just seen, hardware can vary quite a lot. Um, but a huge benefit of web browsers is that they all are striving to implement the same standards, meaning a web page on Chrome on your desktop should run quite the same as one on Firefox on your laptop, regardless of any of your hardware. You know, it, it should run the same on a Chromebook. Sometimes, obviously, if your processor is a little bit slower, it might, if I'm doing something really heavy in the browser, it might slow down. But the point is that a well-designed web app can be really flexible, right? And and if you design it right, it'll run well on a desktop and on a phone and on a tablet and on any kind of screen that might want to run it. So here's a major point for this overview. Web apps are the focus of this course. I think for all the reasons that I've just highlighted above, that should make some sense. Uh, and we'll, we'll get in further uh, with like what else that means for this course going forward. So what is an app? Here's the quick summary. As long as it is a program written in code for a computing device that has an interface for users to accomplish some sort of task, we can call it an app. If that sounds really, really general, congratulations, we're on the same page. But we should also consider the properties of whatever hardware or platform we're trying to run the app on will determine a lot of the features of that app, right? Uh, you have to think about the screen size. Is there audio or haptics available? Uh, what are the inputs available? What's the processing power? And they might be more or less focused on specific uh, tasks, right? So they could be single purpose like a calculator or they could be more complex like for instance, Facebook's apps, which honestly have gone overboard with the feature bloat. Um, they're just always trying to sell you something, aren't they? So yeah, this is the, the quick summary of, of what we mean by app. So now let's leap forward to the next word in the title of the course. What is programming? What indeed? Um, I'm supposed to know already, and at this point I'm too afraid to ask. So. It might seem silly, you know, oh, I'm, I'm already partway through my degree. I, why are we stopping to talk about what programming is? Really, it's, I just want to firm it up for you. So we're pretty clear now on what we mean when we say app, right? Programs that computers run, blah, blah, blah. 
But something that's often overlooked in programming courses is making sure you understand what programming actually is. There is a lot of fear uh, surrounding the concept of programming. People think, oh my gosh, if I type the wrong things, my computer will implode. Like, no. Programming is writing a set of instructions that will accomplish some task when executed. Watch, I'm gonna program you. Consider this mindful breathing program. If you are feeling overly stressed out, try the four, seven, eight breathing method. First, inhale through your nose for a count of four. Hold your breath for a count of seven. And then exhale completely through your mouth while making a quiet whoosh sound for a count of eight. That whoosh is actually part of the, the process. It controls the flow of your breathing. And then you repeat until you start to feel more calm. Got it? Does it make sense? Feel free to try it, but really the point is just whether or not you comprehend what this step-by-step -step process is. What I just described to you was a process you can engage in whenever you're feeling overly stressed out. Now that you have read those instructions, you can keep them in memory and perform the actions described in the order described so that you can achieve the task of chilling the heck out. This is exactly what a computer program is. So, what about a programming language? Are we talking about English or... So the programming language I just used to teach you mindful breathing was English. I described the program to you in a language that you understand. And you're able to figure out the actions you'd need to take because you have a big fancy brain that can fill in the blanks for things that aren't already perfectly specified. Programming languages are just a bit more fussy. Here's the secret that you should keep in mind for the rest of your careers. Computers are really stupid. They can literally only do exactly what you tell them to do. Asterisk being that also, obviously, whoever wrote the software you're using and whoever wrote the computer's operating system and all that kind of stuff. There are things, of course, that are outside of your scope. But in a basic sense, computers only do exactly what they were programmed to do. So we have to help these poor idiot computers out by designing programming languages that are more exact, things that they that we can express to a computer so that it doesn't have to do any inference. It is expressed in a very rigorous and strict way. Watch here. So here I'm gonna lay out some, some you might call them sentences in, um, in a, a fake programming language, right? Pseudocode is how you write things sort of so that you can get a coding flow down without actually thinking about the specific language intricacies, right? So um, the pseudocode on the left, we can instruct the computer to do things by calling functions, right? The print function will say, hey, computer, you should dump this text somewhere. And then we provide it <clears throat> the data value, hello world in text, which is capital H, E-L-L-O, space, capital W, O-R-L-D, exclamation point, right? That is the string that we give to the print function. You're seeing how even this is very strictly defined, right? It is still kind of a language. I'm still instructing the computer, hey, do this thing using this information. And so it does, right? It in instantly prints out, hello world, right? Okay, so... Another part of this is that the computer can't like infer something. It can't fix it for us. If I hit, if I say, hey, computer, print Heldo Borald one, it's just going to do that, right? It, it just does exactly what we tell it to do in the order we tell it to do it, right? So um, if I say print war garble, it'll just print war garble, right? So the, the point there is that computers don't, there's no indeterminacy. There's no, oh, let me, f I can fill in the blanks. It will, j in a programming language, it does exactly what you tell it to do. Um, a few other things just to, while we're here messing around, we can do things like assign variables. We can say, hey, computer, remember that the, the X 
should have the value 10 inside of it. That's what x equals 10 means in most programming languages, which might not, you know, the computer didn't actually do anything externally. It didn't print anything out. All it did was hear, oh, okay, I'll remember that. Now, if I say, hey, what was in x? By just saying the letter x, it might print the 10. Ah, so computers in, in programming languages can instruct computers to do things externally so, hey, dump this to a place where a human can read it, or it might do things internally. And that these are all valid things within the languages. Even more complex here, we can do a little loop. We can say, hey, for each number of one through X, print that number, print the value in each number that is assigned. And so what does it do? It prints one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Now, don't don't focus on this dumb little fake language here. This is again pseudocode. You wouldn't run this. This is just you know to sketch ideas out. But you see the idea here. Uh, I instruct the computer in. It's not a very like human friendly language, but it's still a language. I can give it actions. I can tell it to remember things. I can tell it to do things repeatedly. Right. So um, the idea is that. Program, a, a programming language is designed explicitly with the computer's capabilities in mind. Things have to be written exactly for the system to produce the right actions. So, for example, if I told you in English, go get a drink, you could kind of figure out all the parameters of that, right? What, what I'm talking about, why I said it, what you should probably do. You might not even go get a drink. You just take a break, right? Um, everybody, take, take a break, get a drink. A computer would flip out. Right, it would have to have everything specified. Where, where do I get the drink? What kind of drink? Which cup? Should I drink a single gulp or ten liters? Uh, do I boil Coca Cola or drop it at zero Kelvin? Ah, I can't find a super magnet. It wouldn't be able to achieve a lot of things if you did some, if you gave it instructions that weren't very well specified. So, all of this is to say, programming languages let you give very specific instructions to a computer in a precise and exact way that the computer is good at understanding. So when it comes down to that, then what your job is, is to form those sentences, those programming lines of code in a logically useful and consistent way, which is really one of the cruxes of this course. Programming logic is what one of the major focuses is here because programming logic is what all the languages are built around, right? So logic is the fundamental stuff that we use programming languages to express to a computer, right? Um, they exist to help us describe a process to a computer using, using a series of logical steps. So these logical concepts exist in almost all modern programming languages. And here's just a, a set of them, right? Variables and data types, so storing different kinds of information temporarily, to instructing the computer to do that. Sequencing, so before we give uh, the computer instructions, we got to know what is the actual correct order of the steps. Should I express something first? You, know, you can't use a variable before you've assigned that variable, right? Even though you, human, could probably make the inference later, for the computer, it would just blow up. And metaphorically blow up, it would crash. It would, the, the program you're running would be like, ah, oh, I died. So um, branching, so conditions, conditionals, if then based on the conditions of a certain thing, uh, looping, so repeating a process over and over, which these might sound kind of simple, like, oh, whatever, but seriously, you build any, any complex task and it is just a mishmash of all of these exact tiny things. Um, more complex is defining functions, right? So sometimes, you know, you don't want to write the same steps a million billion times in a row if you're going to have something to do it. You want to group things together into meaningful functions that you can write yourself. And in a similar way, object orientation. So pulling all of the above um, into these conceptually meaningful structures that contain their own data, they have their own behaviors, and then they sort of they can interact with each other at the level of objects in code as opposed to us just like writing every single line, right? 
and don't worry, that doesn't have to make perfect sense yet, but I'm just sort of sketching the future so you can, so we can walk towards it, right? So while on the surface, this course is of, of course about building apps, the deeper purpose is to teach you the fundamental logic concepts of programming in general. So if you get your head around them in one programming language, you'll be well on your way to understanding every programming language in the world. Would you still have to spend time to learn each language's intricacies? Of course. But when you understand the core concepts of what programming can do, you are much better off ready to learn kind of any language that comes your way. So we're going to cover all the programming logic in more depth later in the course, material and all that. But for now, we can I can sort of illustrate to you some of these concepts using that same mindful breathing program from earlier, because it turns out it has quite a few of these in it. So let's review. So the English description, uh, if you're feeling overly stressed out, try four, seven, eight breathing method. Uh, inhale through your nose for a count of four. Hold your breath for a count of seven. Exhale completely through your mouth while making a quiet whoosh sound for a count of eight. And then you repeat until you start to feel more calm. Now, I can tell you right off the bat that things are a little out of order here, but let's, let's even though you still understand it, right? You're a human. Of course, you understand everything that I've laid out here, but we might need to do some reordering and restructuring in this small, <clears throat> small way um, for a sort of a coded version of this to make better sense to a computer. So first, let's kind of break this down into these are English sentences, but we can kind of break them up into what instruction are we giving? What uh, kinds of information are involved in these instructions? Right. So first, here's the, so in our technical description. Um, the first line is actually an example of branching, right? We are saying, if you feel overly stressed, then you can do this thing. So in general, you're not going to do this when you don't feel stressed, right? So that is a conditional based on your current stress level, which I've <clears throat> put in brackets here to illustrate that it, that's a kind of information. That is a piece of data that we might be using in this program. Um, Okay, so now try the 478 breathing method. This is a reference to a known method, a known function, which we then go on to define below. This is very much like how you would define a reusable function in programming. So the mindful breathing function is defined as such. First, perform the inhale function. Now, are we defining the inhale function? No, uh, I think at this point, we're just kind of assuming that inhale is a sort of simple thing that we know how to do, right? I don't have to go into your body code <clears throat> and figure out how inhale works. I can just call it. But uh, we have given it some spec some specifications, yeah? We say inhale specifically through your nose. So the route that we're going to take is the nose. And how long? Well, the duration is four. We're just using the number four to represent the count of four, right? Step two, hold your breath, another function, uh, and we're calling it with a duration of seven, right? Nothing else is specified, so we can just, you know, have it be a simple hold breath for X time. Then we call exhale, right? The exhale function. And again, we are specifying through the mouth. We're specifying a duration of eight. Uh, we're specifying that the sound that we should be making with that mouth is whoosh or the sort of the shape. And then um, also that we are supposed to exhale completely, right? We should be emptying our lungs. All of this is bits of data that we can give to, to the system to make sure we do it correctly. And then finally at the end, we're supposed to loop uh, until our stress level lowers, right? Do this same process a few times until your stress level is at a certain threshold. Okay, so now we've sort of broken down what kinds of information and what kinds of actions and steps are involved here, right? We have some conditionals, we have some looping, we have some some function calling, we, we are, we're defining a function that you can use, right? The mindful breathing function. So, Let's write this out a little bit more clearly in that same pseudocode we were using before. And right off the bat, I'm going to tell you that 
the first thing we need to do to be able to invoke this mindful breathing function, we need to define it first, right? So I'm going to jump right in here and say this is a function that I am learning for, for my, from my object. I am defining a new mindful breathing function that I am capable of invoking, right? So we have to do this to, at the start because if I tried to call this function before it had been defined, it would, it would freak out a bit, right? That's the idea of sequencing. So what is the mindful breathing function? Well, again, we're going to do the sequencing right off the bat. So the very first thing we got to do is describe the, the loop of this, right? So a computer needs to know that it's going to start looping ahead of time. So we do a while loop. So while my stress level, self.stress, my current level of stress is above 100, you know, if 100 is some random number we've picked here, but it's, it's the concept of there is some threshold at which uh, my stress level is considered high. So this, when I invoke this mindful breathing method, as long as my stress level is too high, I'm going to keep doing the following steps. And which steps are those? Well, we're going to call, call my inhale function. And remember, we've got a couple of specifications. The duration is four and the route is nose. That's me calling my inherent inhale method, but I'm also giving it, um, giving it some specifications, right? Next, we do the hold breath call. Uh, we, we do the hold breath action for a duration of seven. And then we're going to call the exhale action for a duration of eight. The route is mouth. The sound should be whoosh. And the um, lungs, we, we need to empty the lungs. So we, we toggle that to true. Again, you don't have to know how all this stuff works, but I'm just illustrating this is much more how, the, how a computer would understand this set of instructions. And then uh, this is also just to, to demonstrate the we we would reduce our stress level at each tick of this operation, right? So I'm arbitrarily saying that at the end of this operation, I should set my stress level to be whatever my stress level was minus one. So it's smaller, right? Okay, that's the full function. This is the the mindful breathing method that we have now told the computer how to invoke. So now we do the top level thing, right? The, the thing that we started with in the English description, we now do after we've defined the method. So if my stress level is above a hundred, then I should call the mindful breathing method and relax myself a bit using it. So this mindful breathing program turns out it was chock full of programming log logic. Uh, so in just this one little example, we've seen multiple data types. We've got both numbers and text. We've seen functions both defined and called. We've seen a loop repeating until we feel better. We've seen a branch. So at the top, only do this if we feel overly stressed. Um, we've got uh, we've got careful attention to sequencing, right? We had to rearrange things to make it make sense. And then finally, uh, we were all, we were working in this sort of object oriented flavor because we are the object, right? We defined a new method for ourselves and we called our own methods and we we checked our own stress levels, right? The, that's all us acting as an object in this programming space. Okay. So that said, that is sort of the, the fundamental logics of, of programming illustrated. Now let's talk about what's in this course. What will we actually be doing? So the major course concepts taken together, this course at the top level is about the basics of building an app, uh, but we'll be picking up most of the fundamentals of programming logic along the way to do that. Let's talk about uh, the course activities and the tools you need to do them. The activities, what will you do? Lectures, or I talk for a while and show you slides like these, right? Uh, lectures will include 
quizzes. So very low stakes, repeatable quizzes, uh, just checking to make sure you're getting specific things out of the lecture, right? I'll also have you doing journals for lectures. So these are a way of reflecting on what you've learned and keeping your text communication skills sharp, um, even if it's just for you and me. That's actually pretty key, guys. Uh, so an issue that happens quite a lot, in, especially in programming uh, education, so information science, computer science, um, software engineering, people forget that your whole point is still gonna be to communicate with humans right? Any job you take, you're not just going to get to sit back and pretend that, oh, I can just talk to computers and not, you have to communicate. So I'm holding you to that and I'm making you write journals, right? They're not complex. It's really not even, you know, it, it's very lightly guided. Um, and really it's only going to be graded based on completion, but it's, it's still pretty important that you're able to verbalize things that you're learning and reflect on them in that way. Also for me, given this is an asynchronous course, um, it's the absolute best way for me to keep in touch with how you are engaging with the course material, you know? Seeing somebody who is kind of struggling with a concept in one journal means that I can jump in and say, hey, like, let me help, you know, explain some of that. W whereas if you're just killing it and you're, you're just really excited, then that also gives me an opportunity to talk to you about the parts that you're excited about. So. Journals might seem like, oh my God, busy work, but seriously, they are they are so useful, especially in an asynchronous course. I'm also gonna be doing a lot of code demos, so things from the lectures that I illustrate um, in a semi-informal manner. You know, I'm, I'll be showing you how things work, how to write some of the code involved in some of the assignments, and you know, all, demonstrating little bits of things too, like how I debug things on the fly, like, oh crap. That didn't work the way I thought it did. Let me show you how I will investigate the correct way for it to work. And then finally, or well, not finally, next and the last of the bulk of the stuff is lab exercises. Um, these will be assigned with a few different little tasks in them, usually three different subtasks that are different flavors. You know, things like filling in code, things like writing your own code, things like um, just editing code, like fixing broken code, those kinds of things. And finally, final exam, um, which is really just a bunch of questions from the quizzes and a bit of writing in the form of a final essay. Again, because writing is important, similar to your journals. So what will you actually need in terms of tools? Only a couple of things here. First is a decent web browser. Uh, decent meaning not, not always the system default. Sometimes they act funny, uh, especially Microsoft Edge. Um, and even Safari has some weird intricacies. I, I prefer we work with Firefox or Chrome. Um, and really the key thing is that because you're gonna be developing code to be run in these browsers, uh, you're gonna need to get used to opening the inspector um, in these browsers. So get friendly with popping that up on various web pages that you visit. Uh, also, you need the web browser to access Brightspace and, and the like, right? Uh, a text editor. Now, you could, you literally can do anything in this course using just Notepad or text edit, the super simple text editors, right? They're not the most friendly programming experience, but I want it to be pretty clear to you that it's all just text. You know, it's all just text in that once was a blank text file, now it has a bunch of text in it. You know, it's not, there's no magic here. It's just a, a bunch of lines of text that your computer will read and then do stuff with it. Um, so, but to to offer, there there are much better text editors for things like web development like we're doing here, uh, like VS Code and Atom. Those are both good, uh, they call them IDEs, Integrated Development Environments, and they're both very flexible. Uh, I would look into those. I, I may do a video, you know, showing you showing you around one or the other of those. Um, they're just a little better overall than a simple text editor. And then finally, an FTP client, a file transfer protocol. So this is what will allow you to connect to the computer science department servers so that you can upload your work and assignments as web pages on your own website. Um, that's a goal of this course is to, you know, elab just keep you keep you messing around as a web developer by having your own website. But at time of writing, 
there are some issues with the servers, so we may need to revert to just handing things in on Brightspace. A little less ideal, but you know, functional uh, in case of the the server issues kind of lingering and causing problems. So now, I, just a quick, we should go over a little bit what are the languages that we're actually going to use in this course, and which ones of them are actually programming languages. Well. You might be coming into this course with experience in some of a few different programming languages. Some of you have touched on Java, others have done web programming. You might have learned Python or Visual Basic or something in high school. Um, let's focus on ones that will be used in this course, which will be the web development languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, something to note, not all of these are programming languages. And in fact, if you're already familiar with these three, stop for a minute and think about what we've talked about in this lecture so far and figure out which one of these is a programming language. Hypertext, markup language, HTML. So HTML is really a description of the structure of a document, right? Uh, in HTML, you're telling the web browser which objects to create, you know, should I build a paragraph or should I build a heading? Should I have a, a table with a bunch of cells in it or should it be a list, an unordered list, right? Um, how should they be structurally related? So which ones are nested in what and in what order? And by default, the browser takes all that structure and just runs with it to make a super basic web page to display. Now, back to that question, is this a programming language? Not really. HTML doesn't involve giving step-by-step -step instructions to the system. It just builds a static page, right? It is a structured document. Now, the ordering matters, but the only real action you can specify in HTML is build this kind of object right here. There's no change it and move it and do things and breathe in and hold your breath and etc. So ultimately, HTML, not a programming language. CSS, cascading style sheets. Uh, so in CSS, we take the objects created in HTML and we modify all kinds of properties about them. So cool, we are drilling into the objects. Nice, we are saying, ah, I'm gonna change things about you. Changes where they are, how much space and padding they have, um, their, their colors, foreground and background, sizes, fonts, animations, give them gradients. Cool stuff, right? We are we are digging into the, the guts of all the things to make them look pretty and, and interesting and functional, right? But again, CSS is about modifying properties. There's no step-by-step -step instructions here. The only action in CSS is change this parameter for this type of object. Again, not programming. JavaScript. And here's a little note here that it's not actually associated with Java at all. Look, like you can look it up. It's just a stupid marketing gimmick that they tried to pull back when JavaScript was first getting going. And now we're stuck with the name, not associated with Oracle or, or Sun systems at all. It's just, it's named JavaScript. Okay. So what do we do in JavaScript? Well, we are typically taking so we're manipulating variables using functions that are triggered by events on the web page, such as user inputs to do things like change the CSS or the properties or the content of the, oh, wait, ding, ding, ding. We got it. JavaScript is a proper programming language. You can perform all of the programming logic that we described in this lecture in JavaScript, all while interacting with all the HTML objects and CSS properties. Really, these three go hand in hand. These are the web dev languages, right? I, I have the structure in HTML, I have the properties in CSS, and I have um, the, the action, you know, the, the, the processes in JavaScript, which JavaScript is a programming language. So that's what's in the course. Now I want to spend a couple of minutes just touching on what's this course do for information science? What role does this course play in my education? Um, because I think that this isn't discussed quite often enough. You know, like what, what is this, how do we connect to this field and what's the purpose? So 
Information science, pretty broadly, has a few different islands. There are more than this, but I'm, I'm just sort of speaking in a, in a broad sense. It's a, few, it's a few different things, information science. Uh, information systems and technology, right? So databases, networks, search systems, thing, tech, the, the tech involved in those as well. So like the server bays and all that. How information systems interact together and work together. It's also got a lot of data science and analysis techniques. So running stats, analyzing data, data um, doing coherent visualizations that actually communicate something about the data to humans. Huh, interesting. Also bits of information theory. So what are bits? How, do, how does logic apply to bits of information? Um, how does information, how is it represented? How is it compressed and transformed, right? And then programming is sort of all the computing techniques that underpin all of the rest of the above. Even more broadly, I would say that information science is kind of about the flow of information. Um, you know, where does information go as input? What things accept information? How is that information stored and what does it represent? How is it transformed and replicated, copied and, and pasted everywhere, right? How does it move within an app or within a computer or across a network of computers, right? And then also how is, the, how is information output back to humans? So, you're very much here to learn specific skills associated with programming and app development, but you're also here to just get comfortable with information, right? Everything a computer does is informational. An app is an informational entity. If you can figure out how any given app is built, and that's sort of the goal here, it's gonna help illuminate the information flow of those apps so that you can start to see it other places in your education, right? And the more you get used to it, the better your overall learning experience will be. So that is how this course should help out with your overall education in information science, I think. So before we go, let's recap. What did we do? We discussed what we mean by the term app, and we talked about various flavors of apps and the platforms they're on, and how the focus of this course is on web apps. Uh, we discussed what programming is, some of the fundamental logic we'll be focusing on. We ran down the course activities and the tools needed um, with the focus on the languages HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And we touched on how the flow of information is the key concept from this course that should apply broadly to information science. Also, before we wrap up, just an editing note. Um, I recognize that my audio is super inconsistent in this recording. Uh, I, I did it all pretty much in one sitting. I just was kind of jumping back and forth. I think I need to reconsider some things about how my mic uh, setup is, is happening. So uh, if it sounds like I'm all over the place, I am, I guess. Uh, we'll sort out soon. Okay, so one last thing, and this is going to happen in all of my lectures. Uh, I'm going to leave you with a final thought. Consider an app you use more or less daily. Think about it like we did today. What's the purpose of the app? What task does it try to help us achieve? What kinds of information does the app use? And what functions can it perform? And how does it transform the information involved? All right, that's it. Take care. Talk to you soon.